Continuation of Chapter 5, Page 33 Then people will tell me, Jerry, how can I know that this is a person I will marry? Genesis 24 is a story of Father Abraham sending Elisa to seek a bride for Isaac, his son. Father Abraham is a picture of Father God, and Isaac, the seed of Abraham, is a picture of Jesus, and Elisa means helper. He is the picture of the Holy Ghost, who is our helper. So, in marriage, God the Father must be involved, the guidance of the Holy Spirit must be what helps us to make all our decisions, Jesus must be the center of that marriage, so that even if we run out of wine or joy, since Jesus is the center of that marriage, he will reserve the best wine for the end, according to John 2, and also in the Bible study he kept the best wine for the end. So the man or woman you get married to, first of all the criteria are, he or she must be of the country and the family of Abraham, Genesis 24 verse 1 to 3 which means a person who is born again whose citizenship is in heaven and belongs to the household of God. It has nothing to do with the name of the church, the denomination of the church that person attends, that person's skin color, that person's origin or earthly country, but the first criterion that matters is that that person must be born again. The second criterion is to determine where in the world you want to live, to spend the rest of your life. Elisa said to Abraham, Perhaps the woman will not be willing to follow me to this land. Must I bring your son back to the land from which you came? But Abraham said to him, Beware that you do not take my son back there. Jehovah, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and who spoke to me, and who swore to me, saying, To your seed I will give this land. He shall send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife to my son from there. And if the woman will not be willing to follow you, then you shall be clear from this oath of mine. Only do not bring my son there again. Genesis 24, verse 5 to 8. Some people never ask this question before getting married, and they end up divorcing. You need to sit down and ask, where do you want to live? The world is now a big village, but still people in their heart desire to live in a particular place. Some people got married and never discussed before getting married where they should live. So after they got married, the wife tells a man, I cannot live more than an hour's drive from my parents. I need to see my parents every day or every weekend. That would not be the wife for Isaac, for Rebecca had to leave her parents to go to another country. Some men have a dream of living in the countryside because of space and want to become farmers in their old age, but they never discussed it before getting married, for their wife never thought about living in the countryside or becoming a farmer. Some people want to live in Africa or in Australia, and they never discussed it before getting married, and after they got married in France, they say to their spouse, I want to live in Australia. Sooner or later, those heart desires of location will become stronger and stronger, and you will want to fulfill it, and if from the beginning your spouse never wanted to live where you want to live, it might become a cause of divorce, for you will go and live on your own there, and your spouse might not follow you. And in the case of Abraham, God was the one who told him where he should live, and he already had a prophecy concerning his future. The advice is when you know already what God has called you to do and where he has commanded you to go or to live, share those details with the person you're considering for marriage. You do not need to reveal everything but the main ones that will affect her life or his life if you get married. The third criterion is a desire of your eyes and that is very important especially for men because they are very visual. No wonder that Naomi told Ruth to wash herself, wear some perfume and nice garments before going to meet Boaz. God said to Ezekiel that his wife was the desire of his eyes, Ezekiel 24, 16-21. Now we are not talking about the lustful desires, which are from the devil, but you yourself, deep in your heart, you know the kind of woman you like, 
or the kind of men you like. Job says, I made a covenant with my eyes. How then can I look upon a virgin? Job 31 verse 1. If the wife is not the desire of the eyes of the man, he will have wandering eyes, and if that man is in a position of power and authority, it will be a weakness that the enemy can use to destroy the testimony of Jesus in his life. When the wife is not the desire of the eyes of the husband, he will not treat her well. The Bible says, Lee was weak of eyes, but Rachel was beautiful and well favoured. Genesis 29 verse 17 When Jacob saw Lee, in his eyes she was not the desire of his eyes, but when he saw Rachel, she was the desire of his eyes. She was beautiful. Because Rachel was the desire of Jacob's eyes, he favoured her. Beauty is relative. It is not what the People's Magazine says. In fact, many top models have low self-esteem and do not like their own bodies according to the psychological surveys conducted in the USA and UK. It hurts women so badly when their husbands have wandering eyes and sooner or later people will start noticing the behaviour of the husband. People have preferences and we need to respect their preferences. God was the one who put it in their heart. If a sister does not want to marry a type of person, we need to respect her choice. Many women have received so-called prophecies for marriage, and deep inside them they do not even like the guy, and they are afraid that if they do not marry that person they will disobey God. This criterion is your heart desire. God says, Delight in the Lord, and I will give you the desires of your heart. Psalm 37 verse 4 There are things you want your spouse to have. Character-wise, a man or woman after God's own heart, a prayerful person, a family person, a caring person, generous, encouraging, hard-working, relaxed, etc. You know deep inside you what the character of the person you want to spend the rest of your life with is. You know what you cannot accept. Jesus will give you the desires of your heart as long as they line up with the word of God. Nobody is a finished product when it comes to character, but a work in progress. But even if we are a work in progress, there ought to be some embryonic aspect of the character we desire to see in the person we want to spend the rest of our life with. The Bible says, Whoever finds a wife finds good and gets favor from Jehovah. Proverbs 18 verse 22 The same thing applies to the one who finds a husband. You need to see the potential in people and believe that the wife or the husband will come to the full potential of the kind of wife or husband God called him or her to be. The fifth criterion is to write down your vision concerning the man or woman you want to spend the rest of your life with so that you may be able to identify that person when God sends him or her your way. The prophet says, I will stand on my watch and set myself on the tower, and will watch to see what he will say to me, and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And Jehovah answered me and said, Write the vision, and make it plain on the tablets, that he who reads it may run. For the vision is still for an appointed time, but it speaks to the end, and it does not lie. Though it lingers, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Behold, the soul of him is lifted up and is not upright, but the just shall live by his faith. Habakkuk 2 verse 1 to 4 if you have not specified what you want, it will be difficult to identify him or her when God sends him or her. And sometimes God gives you a specific word concerning that person. You will be watching and many people will be passing by and talking to you and you will let them go away because you failed to write plainly what you wanted and what God said specifically to you about that person. If you specify what you want and have the specific word of God concerning that person, you will be able to run with that vision and pray effectively, and God will be able to speak to you concerning your vision and direct your steps. The sixth criterion is prayer. 
You need to communicate with God your Father through Jesus Christ what you have plainly written down concerning your husband-to-be or wife-to-be. Eliza prayed and asked for a sign from God as it is written. He said, O Jehovah, the God of my master Abraham, I pray you, send me good speed this day and show kindness to my master Abraham. Behold, I stand by the well of water, and the daughters of the men of the city come out to draw water, and let it be that the young woman to whom I shall say, Let down your pitcher, please, so that I may drink, and she shall say, Drink, and I will give your camels drink also. Let her be the one that you have appointed for your servant Isaac, and by it I shall know that you have shown kindness to my master. Genesis 24 12 to 13. As you read the rest of Genesis 24, you see that God gave Eliza the sign he asked for, and Rebekah was the one who met all the criteria set. She was of the family of Abraham and of the country of Abraham, for us it means she was born again, and her citizenship is in heaven. She has the character Eliza was looking for, a hospitable woman who goes the extra mile in her serving, for Elisa only asked for a drink for himself, but she offered to give a drink to his camels, and Elisa knew that she would be the desire of the eyes of Isaac. And we have the testimony that in the eyes of Isaac, Rebekah was beautiful to behold, and he favoured her and showed her affection, Genesis 26, 7-11. Just like Sarah was beautiful to behold in the eyes of Abraham, Genesis 20. So it was not just the sign which Rebekah did that told Elisa that she was the one for Isaac, but she fulfilled also the other criteria. If she did not fulfill the other criteria, it did not matter if she fulfilled the sign. She would not be the one for Isaac. Some people will pray, If I see a man coming into church wearing pink shoes, he is the one God said I should marry. The next Sunday a man walks into church wearing pink shoes. But the man is not born again, he is not the desire of the heart of the girl, and he is not the desire of her eyes. He must fulfill the other criteria before fulfilling the sign you have asked from God. There is nothing wrong with asking for a sign from God to confirm the word he has already given you, and you have seen manifested. Elisa asked for a sign, and Gideon also asked for two signs in Judges 6 and in Judges 7. It is God who gave Gideon a sign through the dream and its interpretation that the Midianites had. Please read the Bible study on divine guidance to study briefly how God guides his children. Elisa also did not waste Rebecca's time when he discovered that she met many of the criteria he had written down. He told his motives that he was looking for a bride for Isaac and Rebecca met the criteria and he told Rebecca and her family members what the promise God made to Abraham and Isaac was, that they have to live in Canaan and not go back to Mesopotamia. And the criterion was a deal breaker, regardless of the fact that Rebecca fulfilled all the other criteria and the sign he asked for in prayer, but if she was not willing to live the rest of her life in Canaan, then she was not the one for Isaac. There is a TV program on one of the British television channels for people who want to buy a house and its title is Location, Location, Location. Yes, you can meet all the other criteria, but the location is the final deal-breaker. And we see in Genesis 26 the prosperity of Isaac was tied to his location in the land of Gera of the Philistines. When you know what God has called you to do in life and where he's told you to go, do not compromise it even for marriage because you will be disobeying the call of God in your life. The seventh criterion is that the woman has a final say as to whether she wants to marry that man or not. Even in the Bible days, marriage was sometimes arranged, but the woman always had the final say whether she wanted to be married to that man or not. We have seen that in De Deuteronomy 25.5, that if a man left a widow and had not a child, his brother had the right to raise an heir for his late brother by marrying his widow. But it was not automatic. The widow could refuse to marry into that family and go and marry someone else. That is why Boaz commended Ruth 
because she was free to marry whosoever she wanted, not necessarily a member of Elimelech's family. At the end of the day, you are the one who is going to live with that man or with that woman for the rest of your life until death do you part. It is not your father or your brother or your sister or your uncle or your friends who are going to live with that man or woman, but you and you alone. The parents and brothers of Rebecca were happy for her and for the bride price that Eliza brought, but she was the one who made the decision to marry Isaac. As it is written, the parents and brothers of Rebecca called her and said to her, Will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. They sent Rebecca, their sister, away, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant, and his men, and they blessed Rebecca, and said to her, Our sister, be the mother of thousands of millions, and let your seed possess the gate of those who hate them. Genesis 24, verse 58 to 60. A brother was forcing a sister to get married, and he had already set the date of the wedding and started to manipulate the sister with visions and dreams he had, and so-called prophecies he received, and twisting the scriptures. And I explained to that sister, Genesis 24, that she was the one to take the final decision, not the man. Beware of men or women who use, thus says the Lord, to tell you, you are the one to marry them. If you are born again, you are the sheep of Jesus, and you hear his voice. Say to that brother or sister, thank you, I wrote it down, I will also pray, and God will speak to me. Sometimes people use it to manipulate sisters. They know that they are not the desires of the heart of the sister, nor the desires of the eyes of the sister. So they use the name of the Lord to manipulate the sister and put fear into her heart. Manipulation is a spirit of witchcraft, and God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and sound mind. 2 Timothy 1 verse 7 the sister or brother must genuinely love a person before marrying the person and certainly not be forced or manipulated by prophecies to marry. Some prophecies have messed up people's lives. We need to judge every prophecy and test the spirit behind every prophecy to see if it is from God and from the Holy Spirit because if it is from God, it will always line up with the written word of God. Jesus knows how to talk to women and truly honors and respects them in their decisions. He gives us a parable and says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Matthew 13, verse 45 to 46. Back in those days of Jesus, silver and gold were common and the other precious stones, Diamond, ruby, emerald, etc. were also common, but pearls were priceless and they were unique. It is impossible to find two identical pearls in nature. The, the finest quality natural pearls have been highly valued as gemstones and objects of beauty for many centuries and because of this the word pearl has become a metaphor for something very rare, fine, admirable and valuable. In nature there are black pearls, white pearls, yellow pearls, pink pearls, or reddish pearls, and also brown pearls. Just like the races on earth, there are black people, white people, yellow people, red people, and brown people. So the women of all those races are pearls in the eyes of Jesus. Black woman, red woman, white woman, yellow woman, brown woman, and all the mixed races we have on the face of the earth, each one of them is a pearl in the eyes of Jesus and God. Just like Jesus, who is the husband of every born-again believer, likens himself to a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he sold everything he had and gave his life on the cross to pay the dowry or bride price so that we could be married to him. Those women who heard the words of Jesus felt that they were of great value in the eyes of Jesus and of God. Even in 1917, the jeweler Pierre Cartier 
purchased the Fifth Avenue mansion that is now the New York Cartier store in exchange for a matched double strand of natural pearls that he had been collecting for years, valued at the time at one million U.S. dollars. Today, of course, there are mass-produced pearls and fake pearls, but in the eyes of God and Jesus, your husband, you are not a mass-produced pearl or a fake pearl. See yourself the way Jesus sees you, and any man who wants to marry you must treat you as such, a natural pearl of great value. Father Jacob also found his pearl in Rachel, as it is written, Jacob fled to the country of Aram. Israel served to get a wife, and to pay for her he tended sheep. Hosea 12, verse 12 Jacob did the right thing. He did not have money, so he worked to pay the dowry for Rachel. He did not fornicate with her, but waited for seven years until he could have the money to marry her. So Jacob served seven years to get Rachel, but they seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her. Genesis 29 verse 20 so the man God has ordained to be your husband will wait to be married to you before sleeping with you, even if he has to wait seven years. If he genuinely loves you, those seven years will seem like only a few days. Why? Because you are a pearl of great value in his eyes, and he is ready to do the right thing and treat you right. Jesus tells all the black pearls, white pearls, brown pearls, pink or reddish pearls, yellow pearls, and mixed race pearls. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Matthew 7 verse 6 Now here, dog talks about people who are sleeping around, just like natural dogs. Your body is now sacred, which means holy, pertaining to God and to His worship, separated from common secular uses, and consecrated to God and His service. That is what sacred means. So do not throw yourself in the hands of dogs that will defile your body, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit, with sexual immoralities. Those people are pigs! because they fail to see the pearl in you, that you are a pearl of great value, and they ought to marry you before doing anything improper. For a pig everything is common, and can be wallowed in the mud. Solomon says, Like a gold ring in a pig's snout is a beautiful woman who shows no discretion, or who is without understanding. Proverbs 11 verse 22 and unfortunately some beautiful women do not realize that not only do they have a gold ring that God placed on their finger when they became born again, according to Luke 15, but they are also a pearl in the eyes of God, and they allow men, who do not see them as pearls and royalty, to treat and defile them. You are a pearl. Do not throw yourself to the pigs who don't respect you, or who you are and how precious you are. If you do throw yourself into their hands, you will be hurt emotionally and even physically sometimes. They may trample you under their feet and tear you to pieces, break your heart to pieces, impregnate you, and run away like a dog does to other female dogs. So Jesus tells you, you are a pearl. Do not allow any man to treat you that way.